How are you guys doing? Hi, Carly. Hey, how are you? I'm very well. Yourself? Yeah, good. Thank you. Excellent, excellent, excellent. How's lockdown treating you? I'm good. I'm used to this. I feel like my whole life is like self isolation. <laughs> Where have you been prison? <laughs> 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 no, I, um, I've lived. I've lived alone for six years. I have no family yeah. in the UK. Yeah. I'm used. I'm used to this. I work from home twenty four seven. Yeah, but you seem pretty, pretty bubbly. I don't try to strike you as someone who um lacks in social interaction. No, see, I'm like I'm one of those people that's an extrovert, but really an introvert. Mm -hmm. And I, I okay, love yeah. traveling. Like I love going overseas, but I have yeah. no interest in doing stuff in the UK. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Cool. Andrew, how you doing? Fox, how you doing? Not too bad, not too bad, not too bad. It's you're been, you're uh, looking very blue, man. Turn the light on or something. Oh, the light is on, man. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> the light is on. I told you, my room's very dark. It's got, it's my, yeah, my room's very dark. So the yellows are quite yeah. um, peachy stroke. I don't want to say yellow, but like peachy. Yeah. And um, yeah, so not a lot of light gets into the room. I've actually bought um, a very bright light bulb, but that doesn't seem to have made any real difference. Yeah. You're unclear, Pete. Um, no, I know. I think it's something wrong with my camera, if I'm honest. Um, I think there's a bit of um, condensation in it. Okay, cool. So, is everyone ready to rock and roll if I do an introduction or, yeah? Yeah, go for it. Yeah? All right, guys. Welcome to another edition of Fully Booked Meets, Quarantine Editions. You hear myself, Mace? Myself, Fred. And myself, Andrew. And we have a special guest joining us today, goes by the name of Carly J. Yes, that's me. <laughs> hey. Carly, what we like to do here is, before we kind of get into the full kind of, it's, 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 an, it's an interview, but it's more of a chat as well. We just like to give a back, bit of a background story on kind of your personal journey and who you are and where you, where you come from. So do you want to give us a quick rundown of who Carly J is? I'll, I'll do it quick, because I can talk for English. <laughs> oh, oh, so, yeah, exactly. Yeah, talk for Australia. So I am Aussie. I grew up in Australia. Um, I've actually been in the UK 10 years today. Oh, wow. And wow. I never had planned on writing a book. I was shit at English when I was growing up. <laughs> was told I'd never be good at it. Um, basically, travelled the world, ended up in the UK after seven months of backpacking the world, 25 countries. Travelling. <laughs> yeah, travelling. <laughs> <laughs> you are going to get the hang of it very shortly. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure I will. <laughs> but yeah, backpacking the world, just literally going from country to country, ended up in the UK, never planned on staying here. I yeah. was going to travel back home, but then after two years, I ended up staying here, making this home, mm -hmm. finding a whole life mm -hmm. for myself. Um, I was really obese. I was really overweight. I was really unhealthy. And yeah. it came to my journey in 2014. I felt paralyzed. I woke up one morning. I couldn't move. I was like, oh my God, what is going on? And it was the fact I had a trapped nerve that was like my trigger to get up and do something that morning to change my life. And, and I went on a big health journey, massive health journey, no help from anyone, no personal trainer, no nutritionist, no family members, working a full-time job, 55 hours a week, you know, knew nothing about the health industry or anything and decided to prove to anyone that wants to lose weight or get healthy that you can and all you need is your mindset. Yeah. So I went on a massive journey for two years, losing half my body weight and I lost, basically I lost 140 pounds. That's phenomenal, by the way. 63 kilos, and I came oh. to write a story about it. Wicked. So, you, you know, like, um, have you finished your introduction, by the way? I did? Have you finished your introduction now? <laughs> <laughs> no, just checking, just checking. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Already, off one of those, off one of that, because you said um, no kind of nutritional blogs, no kind of personal trainer. Was there any books like that changed your mindset, even? I know you had the, the trap nerve, but was there any, even any books you had read in the past that kind of sprung to the forefront of your mind when you was go when you was going through this process no the, everyone was asking me this like who's my hero who's my inspiration yeah. i hate i hate to say it but i never had one okay it was like i was my own motivation i was my own inspiration to change my own life yeah and i think that's what made me stick to it and that's actually what made me 
like keep at it because it was for so much for me. It wasn't for anyone else. Okay. Uh, Carly, going, going slightly back in, in regards to your traveling, um, you mentioned in your book about Mexico being a catalyst in your in your journey. Have you yeah. been back to Mexico since? No, I haven't. I don't like to go back to two countries like twice if I don't have to. Like I'd rather spend oh. that money on going somewhere new because my goal is to see like a hundred countries by the time I die. So okay, I, haven't. I would love to go back to Mexico. Um, yeah. But I've been back to other places in Central America and the Caribbean and stuff like that. So really? but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We love it. Don't worry, Polly. It's a good thing. When we say traveling, we love it. It's a good thing. No, the reason why they bring it up is because I've backpacked like yourself, and they think I speak about traveling. Um, any and given any and given any opportunity, I'll I'll speak about traveling. So. Oh, okay. I'm the same. So I'll get on with you. Yes. <laughs> so where, where about you when you're traveling? Traveling. So where did you go? I mean, and where did you go when you went traveling? Uh, okay, I've traveled 47 countries so far. But when you backpacked, um, sorry. When I backpacked, I did 25. Wow. Wow. So I literally packed up one bag of clothes in a 20 kilo, typical backpacking, Aussie style, nomad leaving the country. Yeah. And I went all through Asia, all across, I went up through China, across Russia. I was on a train for five days straight across Russia. Yeah. <laughs> Literally went all through Europe driving, went to Oktoberfest, went to like the Running with the Bulls in Spain, went to the Tomato Throwing Festival. Yeah. Literally did every crazy thing possible all across Europe, literally 10 years ago, and ended up in the UK literally with 100 pounds to my name and one bag of clothes. Amazing. What made you want to stay in the UK? It was, it was really bizarre because to be honest, my mum's English and I used to give her a lot of stick about being a whinging pom and saying, why would I want to go to the UK? Who wants to live there? And some odd reason I fell in love with this country. Mm. And I do, yeah. I do think part of it was the fact it was easy to travel from here after I got here. Like it was like a central hub to be able to do more. I got a really good job when I got here and started making a really good income that was like almost too good to be true. Like got an apartment, got a car, got a job. I was like, wow, this is perfect. Why, why break what's not broken? Why do I have to go home to Australia? And it ended up just being such a good time here. And then I found myself on my health and fitness journey, changed my entire life that I will be sad to leave the UK one day because I feel like it's a part of me. But I do believe there's more, like I've got this thing, like Australia made me who I was. I found myself in the UK, but I do believe there'll be sort of maybe one more country I'll go to live. Okay, how long, um, Carly, how long did your journey um, take you in terms of getting to a, a kind of body size that you were happy with? And so my, did, you have any, did you have any setbacks along the way and how did you deal with those? So initially, when I started the journey, it wasn't actually about weight loss. It was to get healthy because of that morning feeling paralyzed and realizing it was a trap nerd. I was like, shit, girl, get the hell out of bed. You're 28 years old. And you're acting like an 80-year-old woman. Mm -hmm. So my, my first instinct was to get up and move my body. Like I was like, move, girl. Your limbs are hurting. Like you need circulation in your body. All you do is work, walk to the car each day. That's it. So... The initial bit was getting healthy because I never thought I could lose weight. You know, my mum always said, oh, you're big boned. It's hereditary. That's how you are. So I was like, oh, fuck it. I'm fat. I don't care. <laughs> like, I never cared. I was always a really confident, positive person. I didn't care I was a size 26 or 280 pounds. I was like, so what? What does it matter? Yeah. Um, so I never cared to lose weight. But as I started to get healthy and take care of myself, I saw the weight coming off. And I was like, God damn, girl, you can lose weight. I was like, shit. <laughs> hey, mum, like, it's not hereditary. <laughs> so for me, it was initially about health. And then as I started to see the weight coming off, I thought, I'm going to do this and I'm going to prove to everyone, no matter what you want to do in life, you can do it. All you need is your mentality. Stop listening to everyone else. Do what you want to do and make it happen. Yeah. So initially, that's when I saw the weight coming off. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to lose half my body weight in two years. So I set myself that goal to lose 140 pounds in two years. And I did it. And I, I, in my book, I talk about this, that I got to that point. And I was like, 
it, it wasn't as exciting as I thought it was going to be because with a health or body journey, I'd set myself this goal. And yes, I was very happy. I was very proud of myself, but I was like, oh, what's next? So I didn't actually feel too many setbacks in the initial two years. I almost found like, wow, this is actually easier than I thought it was going to be. I think it's because I went about it so realistically. Mm. I went about it for me and I almost like cut out all the noise, cut out every toxic person, anything that was distracting me. And I just, I just got to bettering my life. Yeah. And so I didn't really have any setbacks. It was more the aftermath the maintenance, that bit of a thing where everyone almost drops off the wagon. I wanted to prove you can keep that lifestyle. And do you speak about uh, two things? Do you speak about keeping that lifestyle in your book? And the second thing is, when did you make the decision to write the book? Was it right at the beginning, right at the start of the journey, or was it halfway through? I'm going to start writing about this and, and see what where the other thing <laughs> Yeah. So, um, so initially it was in about two. I started in 2014. In 2015, people started saying to me, "You should start an Instagram. You should start blogging this." And I was like, well, "Why? I'm just some chubby chick from Manly Beach in Australia. Who cares?" I was like, I'm just some girl losing weight. What's the big deal? Um, like, I didn't really see it as a big deal. And then I started an Instagram, which kind of really took off. And people started sharing my story around the world, magazines, other bloggers. And I was like, oh, people are interested in this. Yeah. But I think it's because it was such a real life story of a normal woman working a normal job, not using any fads or diets. Yeah. And that's when people started saying, oh, you should write your book. So I actually started the book in 2015, the very end of 2015. Mm. And I could have stopped writing it after 2016 when I lost the weight and submitted it to publishers there and probably hit the peak of the fitness industry market at the moment then as well. But I thought, no, no one talks about the aftermath. No one talks about the maintenance. What about after you lose the weight? So I actually continued to write my book until January of 2018 because I wanted to talk about everything that goes with changing your lifestyle um, and it was in 2018 i set myself the goal of submitting my book to 13 publishers because they some of some agencies in the uk obviously they want you to have a literary agent i didn't and a lot of publishers open their submissions for free submissions in january and i thought bring it on jk rowling got rejected 13 times i'm going to get rejected bring it on yeah. and i submitted it to 13 people and i got three non-traditional offers and that's when I went about the whole book publishing world, getting it out there. Because I thought, you know, I want this to, whether this touches one person's story or a hundred people, it helps. I just thought, you know, it's, it's had a demand for years in the press and, you know, weight loss and all these things. I thought if it can help one person, you know, my little story of waking up one morning feeling paralyzed, if I can help one other person change their life, whether it be weight loss or not, because... I think, Dan, if you know from my book, it's not just about weight loss. It's about the mentality that you can have nothing and change your life. And mm -hmm. I thought, if I can even help someone who wants their dream job or wants to travel the world or, you know, it's all about your mentality. mentality. So tell me, I, I, it feels like it's just me and you on this call. Sorry, I will No, stop. she's been very clear and you're asking. Oh, and actually, Mason, you're actually, asking, you're actually asking very good questions. So. Yeah, and, I, and the other time, I'm just really interested in your story. So you've fallen, in, you've fallen in love with Britain. British culture, generally speaking, is two or three nights a week, go out to the pub, have a few, have a few drinks, have some dinner. How have you found, I don't know what kind of girl you were before like this whole journey you went on, you were like that anyway, but how have you found that transition? Do you still watch what you eat? And how does it, how does it work essentially? Were you, were you still adopting British kind of cultural norms and values? Or was it, okay, even though I'm not consciously noting down, you know, this has, such and such calories, I'm still kind of wearing what I'm eating. How were you dealing with that and, and socialise with friends and yeah. So naturally being Australian, we love to party, we love to drink, yeah. we live for going out to bars and that. So yeah. growing up, in my book I talk about drugs, I talk about smoking, I talk about alcohol, I talk about being like a crazy rebellious teenager and that was my life. I was a real party girl. I loved it. Like I did what I want, when I wanted, I went out, I could drink anyone under the table. I could have 40 vodka cranberries in a night out. I smoked a pack of cigarettes for me. <laughs> I was a huge drinker, but my body weight could take it. Like I could just absorb alcohol. I smoked, I took drugs when I was younger. I, I went out partying. We used to go out to five in the morning street racing. <laughs> like, I was crazy. Yeah. And 
coming to the UK, my life was a little bit like that. But as I got more into traveling, my partying had slowed down a bit anyway, because I was more interested in traveling. I'd done all my partying since I was 14 years old. You know, from 14 to 24, I partied. 24 to 28, I traveled and put on lots of weight. And then 28 years old was when I was like, no, I need to do this for me. I've done that. I've clubbed my life away. I've been out to bars. So for the first sort of six to nine months of my journey, I quit smoking. I basically quit drinking. I stopped going out. And I did lose some friends at that point in my life. I didn't really care to go out to British pubs anymore and eat, eat bad food. Because the funny thing is, when I, when I was big, I actually ate a lot of healthy food. Like, I've always loved cooking. And in Australia, we make a lot of fresh food. We don't eat a lot of packaged meals and fried foods. And I come from a foodie family that like my parents are in the food business. So in the UK, I've always loved cooking. I don't eat takeout. Even when I was big, I wasn't the biggest fan of it. But I did miss going out drinking with the girls and stuff like that. But something in my mind was like, I don't care for it anymore. It's like, literally, my life changed overnight. When I made that commitment to get healthy, I did it. And I remember one Saturday night, I was in the gym at 11 o'clock at night. And I thought, well, wow, has my life changed? Yeah. It, was, it, it was crazy. Mm. Sorry, I had, um, probably, probably not as good as, uh, as Mason's question, but I mean, at what point did um, blogs and let's say magazines start taking notice of your journey as to um, you losing weight? Um, it was probably within the first year, probably only a couple of months after I started my Instagram. Um, within a year of having my Instagram, I had about 50,000 followers. Jesus. And it was because a lot, that was sort of the peak of the fitness and transformation Tuesdays and all that yeah. stuff on Instagram was really blowing up. She and like one of my pictures once and I was like, why? <laughs> what are you liking my picture for? But it helped my page grow. And then, um, I got picked up by a journalist and she sold my story to a few magazines here in the UK um, and the Daily Mail in Australia picked it up and ran it as the top story on the Daily Mail. And I, even at that point, I was like, have you not got a better story in, in Australia to run than a girl losing some weight? Like I had my mum calling me. I thought someone had died because I had that many missed calls on my phone. I was shocked. I was like, well, what is the paper running this story for? But then the Sun here in the UK did quite a big shoot with it. Um, and actually the photo from that photo shoot is the cover of my book. Okay. Um, and yeah, it, they started picking it up and I had a lot of attraction on social media from even just um, people wanting to share my story. A lot of athletes, I've had like footballers in the UK, basketballers in America, people messaging me like, wow, that's inspirational. Mm -hmm. And I, I really appreciate that. Like I do, I do believe it's inspirational, but I also was sort of like, is it that? Is it? I was like, is it? Insp I didn't actually see it as inspirational until the amount of women and, and men I had messaging me on my Instagram saying it was helping them. And that's when I felt like I had a responsibility in a way to keep it up. So I know, I know, French, you had a question, and um, I, I don't want to stop you from asking your question. I just want to highlight 140 pounds, did you say? That yeah. is phenomenal because, I mean, don't I show you. I mean, I'm just, like, with the numbers itself, I'm trying to think, I weigh, just say, in the region of 80, 90 yeah. AG, which is pounds, correct? I mean, that is a lot. I mean, I'll struggle to shift 5'10 now. Yeah, so, well, this, well, this is the thing. <laughs> I, was, I was 20 stone, so 127 kilos, 280 pounds, a size 26 in the UK, and I'm only 5'3". I am short as. So, five I, yeah, 5'3". <laughs> So I was, I was wider than I was tall. Like I was big and I, I looking back now, I'm like, damn, I was big. Like, I don't remember it. I think because I lived my life like that, like I was a beast from a child. So it's all I knew. And I didn't realize how much weight I was carrying. I was just going up and up a dress size. And even though I felt healthy, I never had any health problems or nothing. I was starting to feel lethargic and more tired than probably a 28 year old person should. And my joints were starting to ache. And I think it was like that trigger that made me keep thinking about it. And then that, that last trigger that morning, that trap nerve, because that, that, that's why I titled my book half, um, half the size, but twice the life. Cause I literally lost half a person. Mm -hmm. Like I always joke that I lost my twin. <laughs> cool.
Going back to like the, the point of being paralyzed, do you think that you can teach self motivation or do you have to have like a, a moment like that for it to be something that's going to change your life, so to speak? I think there can be a little bit of both. I think, I do think you need something personal to happen to you, big or small, to make you change something significant. Because if it was that easy, we wouldn't have obesity as one of the worst health problems. You know, everyone would be slim. Being, being fat wouldn't even be an issue kind of thing. So I do think when it comes to weight loss or any goal, it could be you want to run a marathon, you want to put on, you want to become a bodybuilder, whatever it might be, you need something for it to mean it to you. If not, you will give up. It's, it's like people that join their friends in the gym and say, yeah, I'm going to start coming to the gym with you. Do they actually want to, or they're trying to like do it because society wants them to, or their partner wants them to, or they want to fit into a dress this summer. When those people, when it doesn't mean something to someone, I think you will start to lack motivation. You'll give up, you'll become lazy. It's like that saying, if you want something bad enough, you'll find time. If you don't want something, you'll find excuses. So mm. I, my entire life I was big. And it wasn't until I had these, I had sort of like three sort of triggers and it was the last one being that, that paralyzed bit that made me realize, okay, something's trying to subconsciously tell me to do something. So mm. I, I do, I do believe you can have motivation because I've always believed my entire life I've had motivation, but it depends what for. Like if I want something in life, I go and get it, but I never cared to want to lose weight or get healthy. But the day I did, I did something about it. I never looked back. And, oh. and like, I, I mean, I find it kind of phenomenal in that, like, a trap nerve, that can happen to almost anybody. But it was that which, obviously, I know you had some form yeah. of motivation, but that was your trigger. Um, have you found or do you find now, following, obviously, your amazing, your amazing journey, that you have a lot of drive and motivation to maybe, I don't know, achieve something else? And is there something else? Yeah, I think, I think from that now... And this is what I tried to make my book about. My, my book wasn't just to be about weight loss. It was trying to show when you have the passion and drive and the right mindset, human beings are incredibly powerful people. And I think we forget that. We have the media and things every day telling us we need help to achieve things in life. But if we scrap all that, we have so much inside us, so much power. And I think my weight loss journey taught me that. I was like, girl, you can do anything. Like you have not one family member. You don't have one person supporting you. You don't have a partner to come home to each day trying to tell you to eat healthy. You did this all yourself. Not with any money in the world or anything. So I, that was to me was like, girl, you, need, you can do everything you want. And that's, that's also what spurred me on to write the book because I was like, girl, you can get this published. Why not? If other people can, so can you. And it was that sort of thing. If I want to go travel the world or if I want to start a business now, I'm like, yeah, I can do it. Because what's stopping, if I want something, what is stopping me? And I think that's, I've always had quite a powerful, ambitious side to me. Like even the whole traveling the world, packing up and going with nothing. I've always had that drive. If I want something, I will go after it. But now it's made me realize I can have whatever I want. As long as you're willing to work for it. Thank you. Oh, brilliant. In, um, we're in Sorry, go on, French. I was going to say, we're in quarantine at the moment, so obviously people are probably going to be eating a lot more and things like that. Is there anything that you're doing to avoid snacking, or is there any particular snacks that you're actually having yourself? So um, for me, I work at home 24-7 anyway, so I'm used to being quite conscious of what I'm eating. And through my journey, I learned a lot about my bad habits versus my good habits. Um, for me, I am quite structured in the day. If I am eating a lot, I'm trying to think, why am I eating? Am I eating out of boredom? Is it is just there? Because I know personally, I've got a really bad habit of always wanting to eat something. And that, that comes from my bigger days in my childhood, that I was always snacking on things. So I know that's personally one of my own issues. But I think for the population in general at home at the moment and always going to the fridge, it does come from boredom. We're in the house 24 seven. You often do it to avoid doing another task that you're meant to be doing. So if you are wanting to snack, make it a healthier one. Like there's no harm in still eating something in between, but make it something that's going to fill you up. So snacks higher in protein will keep you fuller for longer. Uh, my other thing is as well, nine times out of 10, we're not actually hungry, we're thirsty. So have a big glass of water. I mean, 500 mils of water, have it. 10 minutes later, if you were still hungry, have a proper snack, like have something decent. But 
if your dinner is coming soon, don't, don't like you're better off having a good meal. Um, so I'm quite conscious during the day to make sure I am like not eating a lot of crap or snacks or things that are bad for me because we can't also do our normal activity each day. Um, if you're used to going to work, walking to the bus, walking to the office, you may not be doing that normal exercise as well and output of calories. Um, so it's also just remembering like what, what is this worth to you? And if, if someone wants to have a snack, have it. Like I'm someone that's never going to starve myself. I, I possibly couldn't. I love food too much. <laughs> but I, I'm a big believer in always taking credit for what you're doing yourself and asking yourself, why am I having this? Do I need it? It's okay to question yourself and really analyze your own actions because I think we don't do that enough. We wait for someone else to say, do you need that biscuit? It's like there's no harm in asking yourself that question. Um, so, it's, yeah, it's, it's just I think about being smart about it as well. Um, but having healthier snacks, higher in protein, fruits, nuts, vegetables, that kind of thing. Do you, Carly, do you actually give it um, on a professional basis? Do you actually give advice to people about weight loss and, and healthy eating and stuff like that? Yeah, I do now. So when I came to the UK, I actually got into a recruitment job. And that's what kept me here in the UK and helped me travel so much because I was earning good commission. And I fell into that recruitment job. Um, but now I have studied as a nutritional coach. And I, I, I'm doing a personal trainer coach, not to be a standard PT though. That was more for my own benefit. Um, but I do a lot of things to do with like weight loss advice. Um, I'm not a trained dietitian or life coach. So I do say to people, disclaimer, I'm not, but qualified by experience. If you want advice from me, I'm happy to do it. Um, but the nutritional coach thing is something that I have done so that I can practice and actually doing food programs and plans and things. Because I think the end of the day, we can all train, we can all do exercise, but if your diet isn't right, that will be the bit that does let you down. Mm -hmm. um, because I used to actually do a lot of sports when I was younger in Australia. Everyone knows Aussies love sports and I did a lot in school, but I was still incredibly obese. And it's because I was eating almost 4,000 calories a day as a child. Like my parents, wow. give, yeah, my parents were giving me adult sized meals and I came from a really strict family that you weren't allowed to leave the table until you finished your plate. And you know, they're starving children in this world. Eat your food. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we know that, trust me. I was just more out of, I think, born out of poverty. Don't be wasting that meal because, <laughs> you know, it wasn't easy to get that food on the table. <laughs> yeah so so for me i actually did a lot of sports as a child but i was still probably double the size of any kid in my class so yeah. i do believe it all comes your nutrition is probably more important you can do a little bit daily daily activity is brilliant for everything to do with your body your cardiovascular your lungs your heart your brain everything but food is the key i think to get right mm -hmm. Oh, is there any resources that you use to help with your healthy eating? You know, like uh, some people use apps to, to count their calories and things like that. No, so this is something I talk about in the book as well, because everyone's like, oh, what macros do you do? What protein, what fat? And I was like, you know what? I've never counted macros in my life. Um, oh. I've never even used an app. Mathematically in numbers, I'm quite good with, but I never wanted to be one of those people that religiously eats, like counts every calorie, like, down to the T. I was like, no, that's too obsessive for me. I wanted to make this a healthy journey where I enjoyed it. And I educated myself about stuff as well. So I could tell you how many calories are in a banana. I could tell you how many calories are in a handful of almonds or rice or pasta or whatever it may be. And I did it really roughly. I never counted fats or proteins or anything. I was just more conscious I've always been quite good with foods and knowing what's in something nutrition wise, because I've always been really interested in it anyway, but I chose never to use an app because I think that's when people start to get really paranoid about things and people that maybe do do um, like have issue more issues with food and obesity and bulimia and anorexia. That's when it can start to go a little bit too wrong. I believe um, I was big on weighing myself because I believe with any journey, you have to track it somehow. You have to know what you're going for. So for me, I did weigh myself a lot with the scales, but that didn't mess me up. Whereas I know some women really struggle with weighing themselves. It puts them off. Um, so you have to know what's right for you. Some people like you, yourself, you may want to use an app. If you do use it, but if you know it's going to do a negative effect to you, don't use it. I, I, I lost 140 pounds with never tracking on an app, never counting macros. 
Yeah, no, um, I've kind of lost track of it. But I mean, I think what the basis of it was is obviously with our last guest, he was speaking of in relation to traveling that when he had kids, he would gladly let them go and travel with, um, you know, with the, with the possibility of, you know, just seeing where things go with the possibility of things actually going wrong. And obviously with you not necessarily having someone to fall back on, what was... I mean, what did you do? But at the same time, what was the what the worst you saw? But what was um, um, something you look back on and think, you know what, that was really, really difficult, but you got over it? In terms of my travelling? Um, yeah, I mean, yes, in relation to travelling, but I mean, you can say so in general, even yeah. as to your travels, um, <laughs> as to your time here as well. I think knowing that I really don't have anyone to fall back on, like lots of people do have family members, they could ask for money if something goes wrong or they get stuck or, you know, having a partner or someone that has a job in the same household as you. I don't have those things. So for me, I know at the end of the day, I'm the one person I can count on in my life. And I think that's quite a powerful thing for me. It's it actually is something that motivates me and keeps me going that I know I'm the one person I will spend my entire life with. I'm the one person I will share every thought with. I'm my own best friend, I'm my own lover, I'm my own protector. And that's what I always say to people, we need to give a lot more respect and appreciation to ourselves. Whereas a lot of people hate on themselves. I, I love myself and that's not in an arrogant way. It means it's like a self-love kind of thing because I know I have to big myself up. I'm, I'm my number one supporter you know, because I don't have those things. And I think when I was traveling and when I got here trying to find a job, that was actually my motivation and determination. There were, I, I'm not someone that likes to fail at things. And if I do, that's okay, but I'll go and do it again. And for me, when I got here, it was like, I had to make it work. I had to find a job. I had to get somewhere to live. I had to get a car, you know? And I just had to make everything work because there was no other option. And I think when you have that mindset, that determination, you're, you're gonna make yourself go for it. Like it's, it's the whole affirmations and believing and positive think, thinking and like, you know, like the book, The Secret and stuff like that, that sort yeah. of mentality. I was never like, what if I can't do it? What if I fail? I was like, no, you, you don't fail. <laughs> like, so I think for me, even in my traveling, it was like, I'm quite sensible as well. I can make the right decisions. I'm quite a fun person. I'm quite outgoing. I'm quite a risk taker but I'm also quite like an old wise woman <laughs> that I have to be because I don't have those things to fall back on. And how have you used those experiences with what we're going through at this moment in time? Because for some people it might be quite difficult, truth be told, um, because although for some it's like, well, we're at home and I've got a few things to do and I'm working X, Y, Z, but truth be told, we're in a pandemic, which is probably one of the worst type of situations you actually find yourself in. But I mean, with some of my own travel experiences and the things that I've gone through as to being on your own, um, learning to love yourself, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not going to say this is a walk in the park because I think that might be a little bit disrespectful for those yeah, yeah, who, yeah, are yeah. Going, who really are going through things, but I'm very comfortable, very comfortable. Oh, I've got my family here, so I'm not necessarily on my own, but I am quite comfortable. I don't really have any real issues as to... Um, I don't, I don't feel I have any issues, whether it's financial. I, I've, we have lived on, I don't want to say noodles, but we, we, I, was, I was eating food which was next to nothing, you know, which probably had no, oh, nutrition, oh. no nutritional value, yeah. which is not necessarily a good thing in regards to dieting, but in relation to budgeting, et cetera, et cetera. But I feel I've seen worse. Well, that's the thing. I've, I've lived with minus two pounds in my account and needed petrol and things like that. I've been in bad times. I've, I've seen even when I was growing up, my mum going through stuff like that as well. So I think I've been in bad situations in my life, but nothing like what we're going through at the moment. And I, like you said, I'd never be disrespectful to anyone and say, this is a breeze. I'm, I mean, I am enjoying lockdown for myself, but I do know there is bad things going out there in the world in terms of that. But when I say... I'm enjoying lockdown. I mean that I always see a silver lining or I always make the best out of a situation. I know it is horrible what is happening in the world right now. People losing their lives, you know, people not having jobs, things happening where people are out of your control. And this is what I try to always think that the situation could be a lot worse. It could be a hell of a lot worse. And I do believe other generations have been through a lot worse than what we're going through right now. Like we're not being sent out to war, being shot and murdered. But yes, there is a silent killer and invis invisible virus we can't see damaging you know every country around the world 
So I do agree it's a really bad situation. Um, but for me, I always try to say there's something you can't control. Don't set yourself up for disappointment by worrying about it and being anxious. You have to focus on things that you can control and what can you do to make your situation better. Um, so for me, like you said, I'm, I'm generally a really positive person. And I do believe that you have to make the best out of a situation. Like what can you do for yourself right now? And try to take every day as it comes. Like you have to, if you are in a bad place right now, you have to look at what are your options? Who can help you? What can you do for yourself without worrying too much about the long term right now? Because my, my thing is as well to always have faith and always have optimism. Being positive doesn't mean you have to be happy every day. It means that you know that there's better days coming. So being positive and being optimistic, I think we will get through this. Like I, I'm absolutely positive. We, we all will get through it. I know some people have lost family members and lost jobs, but there will be brighter days ahead. Like there will be something that comes out of this. Um, so I know it's a really unfortunate situation, but I think you have to take, if you're someone that really struggles in this current climate, being alone at home, that you just have to take each day as it comes. Don't put too much pressure on yourself. You know, I'm someone that wants to learn a, learn a new course or use this time for me, but the next person down the street doesn't have to do that. You don't have to go out crazy trying to learn a new language, doing 10 courses and doing every bloody IG live workout there is to feel like you've accomplished something. If you want to sit on the couch and do nothing all day, do it. If you want to do 10 workouts, do it. Because I think everyone's situation is different and you stop listening to so much outside noise, the news, and just focus on what you can do to make yourself feel good each day. It would be a statesman with that, with that answer. I like that. It was really good. <laughs> um, we don't want to take too, much, take, take too much of your time, but we will, we will ask a couple more questions and also play a game. It's, um, we'll get into that, then uh, we'll, we'll let you go. If that's all right. I've got nowhere to be. Don't worry. I'm stuck in the house. <laughs> Uh, boy, did you have any other questions? No, I didn't have any questions. I think she's been quite thorough with her with her responses. Um, um, I was going to ask, what's go on, go on, Miss. No, I was going to say not not for myself. I was just it was more of a a kind of personal generalized question, but just because I know you've travelled so much, and there's a there's a certain someone on our <laughs> podcast team who loves travelling. No names mentioned. Um, I, I was just going to say, what's probably been your favourite country you visited, and why? Is that been Everyone always, everyone always asks me this and I'm like, there's so like, I, I always think it's like Mexico or Thailand or like, I loved Italy. But for me, there's just, I love countries for certain, like the experience I had there or a certain memory of something. Like I'll always love Russia for the train ride I did across the country or like the random stuff I did across Europe. So for me, I did love Mexico. I have loved Thailand. Um, Turkey is a country that I, have a real soft spot for um so yeah there's there's so many places but like for me this this year i would have ticked off sort of 48 49 and 50 which have all been cancelled because of the epidemic but it didn't make me sad it was like it's not meant to be right now yeah, yeah. um but yeah i do actually want to go live in america which i know is quite a taboo topic to lots of people like everyone's like why do you want to live there um but i think i've done my 10 years in the uk my next chapter is to go live in LA, hopefully by the end of this year or beginning of next year, and then maybe travel a lot more of that side of the world that I haven't been able to do as easily as you can from here. So yeah, I, I've got a big love for any, any island, anywhere with a beach. Um, that's usually what I, what I like. Cool. Uh, speaking of, of liking things, what do you do that makes you happy? Oh, hang out with friends, exercise, travel. <laughs> I love cooking, absolutely love cooking. Um, pampering myself, I'm a trained beauty therapist and masseuse. So anything that just makes me feel good, um, listening to music, sitting in the sun. Yeah, any, any simple pleasures to me. I'm not someone that needs big fancy objects or shopping or anything. It, su sunshine makes me happy. <laughs> good old vitamin D. Yeah, that's it. Mm -hmm. um, as you know, this is a, a book podcast, so we're gonna we're gonna play a game based around books. Um, oh, I'm sure you've heard of the, the adage called uh, "Don't don't judge a book by its cover." Yeah. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, we can. Yeah. 
I can't. I'm just. Oh, don't ask me. Book. I'm really shit with other people's books. <laughs> don't worry about it. Basically, what we're gonna do, we're gonna flip that that adage on its head, and I'm gonna name some books, and you just say dope or trash based on the name only. Okay. 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 Yeah. So the first one, uh, Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. Shit. You have to say dope or trash. <laughs> or, <laughs> huh? You can say dope or trash or shit will suffice as well. <laughs> what do I mean to say good or trash? <laughs> yeah, I mean, dope you or trash. Huh? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Basically like a false story. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay. Dope or trash? Pardon? <laughs> Just say good or bad. Good oh, or I bad. I a book title and I was like, what? <laughs> no. Next one. To Kill a Mockingbird. Good. Um, the Diary of a Young Girl. Trash. <laughs> Fifty Shades of, Fifty Shades of Grey. Oh, shit. <laughs> that was boring. That was boring. That was that was not been warned. <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> You've been warned. Oh, I've never even heard of it. Let's just say it's good. Uh, the Alchemist. Oh, good. I'm reading out at the moment. <laughs> okay. Uh, the kid. No. The Great Gatsby. Good. The Book Thief. Trash. <laughs> the Seven Principles of Highly Effective People. I'm going to say good. And what's the last one? Quantum Warrior. Doesn't sound like my thing, so I'm going to say trash. <laughs> <laughs> and the last one being... Half the size, but twice the life. Good. <laughs> oh, I like it. You've got props as well. <laughs> I had it here. No, by all means, put it up. Show, show the people. Yeah, show everyone. Do you know what? I had a couple of other questions for you, Carly. Sorry, I should have asked them before. That is amazing, by the way. That is Thank amazing. You. Have you got, um, earlier on in the interview, you mentioned that you've got three non-traditional offers. What does, in, in terms of for your book, what does non-traditional mean? And the second, the second question is, you just put up your first, have you got plans to write another book? Yes, I'm writing one at the moment. Well, I'm writing a lot, actually. Okay, okay so in the, in the UK, if you don't have a literary agent, or you're not someone like, you know, Joe Wicks, or um, you know, a famous author or someone, they, yeah. they don't know whether to take a chance on you. So just, just like an actor might need an agent to get a movie role in the UK for some of the really big publishing houses like Simon and Schuster, Penguin, all of that, they want you to have a literary agent who takes obviously a cut of your deal. If you don't have one and you're a no named author, they will offer you what they call a non-traditional contract, which probably isn't as high as royalties. And they also sometimes will ask someone to pay them to publish it. And it could be anything from a grand to five grand. It depends on the company and what royalties they want to give you, whether it be 25, 50, 75, what it might be. You know, a big, a big author like the Harry Potter books and everything or any of these big fitness people like sort of my competition in the market in terms of books and things like that, they probably get 90, 95% of their royalties. Um, but then they probably don't have to pay. So a lot of the smaller houses will take a chance on you and give you what they call a non-traditional offer. Um, but you can, you can bargain and negotiate with them if you're a good saleswoman and pin them against each other. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yes, I'm actually writing a couple of other books. I am doing recipe books. So my, obviously my passion is food and being able to eat what you want. Like I still eat cake, I still eat burgers, but I eat healthier versions. So I actually have three cookbooks, three recipe books I'm making. Um, looking for a different kind of publisher for them compared to who published my first book. I really want a good food publisher for them. Um, and then I'm actually writing a book on the modern world of dating. Okay, and that's interesting. Dating. We're going to have to get you back on. That is, that's, that's my thing. Relationships well, 
I, I really want to pitch it to Netflix and actually make it into a TV show as Sick. well as a book. Sick. Let me cast, please. <laughs> oh my God, yes. <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of the stories are about my actual dating experiences. So if, if you've seen that TV show on Netflix called She's Gotta Have It. I know of it, but I haven't seen it. Or like I'm um, Insecure on HBO. I know what that is as well, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's probably a similar, or like a modern Sex in the City. Mm -hmm. It's probably like a mixture of those shows of my dating experiences that are all going to be anonymous and okay. also stories I've heard about the dating world and things cool. like that. Cool. Oh, that sounds interesting. Yeah, for me, Very uh, we'll interesting. Have to get you for It'll be funny. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Uh, do you want to go have a question, uh, P or Mace? No, I don't um, have another question. Yeah, no questions. Um, Thanks a lot, Carly, for coming on. Do you want to just, um, for the listeners, viewers, can you just give everyone your plugs for your social media and your contacts and that? Yeah, so if anyone wants to find anything, head to my website, which is www.misscarlyj.com. Um, my Instagram is misscarlyj underscore healthy living. And my book is half the size, but twice the life. Really and you true. can really buy that pretty much anywhere in the world. About 40 different bookstores have it. Yeah, cool, wicked. Um, thanks, thanks for coming on, and thanks. No, thanks for having me. I really love that. Um, yeah, I loved it. Uh, what was I gonna say? I was gonna plug us as well, actually. Um, so, guys, yeah, um, this episode obviously we're available on Instagram, full underscore e underscore booked. Uh, Twitter, SoundCloud, the same, the same tag. Uh, Facebook, fully booked, full e booked. Uh, YouTube, which will, this will eventually be on in the next several days, I'd say, guys. We're gonna get yeah. this up on YouTube. Um, yeah. It's full. Uh, uh, space e low, lowercase e and in dash books and if you want to email us about being on the show or for any other information it's fully booked as f u w -L, l e booked b w o k e d at gmail.com but carly lovely i really enjoyed our conversation this evening i'd love to yeah, catch you. Yeah, we'd love to catch with you best, for sure. best saturday night i've had in a while guys oh that's nice <laughs> <laughs> have a nice evening thank, thank you, you. Um,